Hello. I am a designer. Next slide, there we go. And I actually believe that everyone in this room is a designer. You just might not be using that word for it. Um, as you know, today's theme is disruption. And disruption can mean a lot of things. It can mean something that happens to you. It can definitely be something that comes at you. And it can also be something that you create. When you see a pattern in the world and you want to change something, disruption can be something that you do on purpose deliberately. So let's call that disruption by design. And when we're talking about disruption by design, it is true that design is not about the thing, although historically, design is all about the thing, it, the shape it takes, the color, um, the way it looks, the way it operates. But in, the, in this case, we're talking about designing behavior change. And when we talk about behind, designing behavior change, it's not about the thing, it's about what the thing makes us do. So. I really do mean the thing, because uh, you, you really have to have a thing often. No one just conjures behavior change. You actually have to have something that sparks behavior change. And often that thing is a thing. In my work as a designer, I spend a lot of time in the field, which means that I'm actually out in the context of the thing that we're making to understand how it's going to behave and how it's going to perform in that context. I carry a camera a lot. I take a lot of pictures. And I've trained my brain and my eye to look for certain things, for certain opportunities, for behaviors that mean something. And when I see those things, I often take a picture. And I'm going to show you some of those in a minute. Um, this is something that I've learned from my work in the field. This is sort of a universal truth. And I don't know if you believe me or not, but I'm going to try to prove it to you today that humans are very good at making things work. Now, if we think about this as literally things, we're very good at this. So take um, your glasses break. And you put a little safety pin in the hinge to keep the earpiece from falling off. That's a really good workaround. That's a really good um, behavior. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for in the field. And that is a form of design. It's also a form, in a very small scale, of disruption. Because you're taking something that isn't working and you're changing it. So these are some pictures that uh, I would like to share with you from my collection of examples of this happening. So this is a woman, uh, this taken on a train. This woman is um, protecting her camera from the rain. It was raining that day. It's a really simple need. She puts a plastic bag over her camera, and voila, problem solved. Uh, this woman is on the floor of the airport. And uh, she, even though there are many chairs available at this particular gate, she's sitting on the floor because this is where she can plug in her laptop. Now, this is a pretty familiar scene, right, at the airport these days. In fact. We, we sort of vie for these really valuable spots on the floor at the airport so we can plug in our electronics. And you can tell from the angle of the photograph that I am sitting on the floor <laughs> across the terminal from her taking this picture. Um, this woman has found a very clever place to put her beer while she eats her hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> and this is a picture that I took out the window of my car in San Francisco, endangering myself and my fellow drivers because I had to have this picture of a man washing his car with a Swiffer. <laughs> so we're very good at adapting our own behavior. Um, and we're actually really good at signaling to other people how we would like for them to adapt their behavior. So let's look at a couple of examples. The driver of this car um, has put cardboard boxes on either side of the car to signal to us that it's really important to him that we not scrape up his bumpers. Now, these are just cardboard boxes, right? But it's not about the thing. It's about what the thing makes us do. This is my colleague, Michael. And Michael's sitting at his desk in our design studio. We work in a really big, open plan um, studio where nobody has an office or a door to close. So we've kind of adapted this signal to one another that if you're wearing your headphones, it means you're listening to music, you're in the zone, you do not wish to be disturbed. It's become such a popular signal, in fact, that I often put on my headphones without any music, just to get some peace and quiet. And so in this case, it's really not about the thing. It's about what the thing makes my colleagues do. Sometimes we need a more explicit signal. We need it to actually be written out for us what it is that we're supposed to be doing in a given situation. And what follows is but a small sampling of my collection of photographs of signs signaling behavior. 
This is from a credit card swiper at a convenience store. Pretty simple. Please use your finger to complete the transaction. Um, now, what I love about this is that there was, there was some kind of pattern of misuse or confusion that led to the need for this sign. And it's a really simple thing. It's just a little post-it note. They stuck it on there. But it's not about the thing. It's about what the thing makes us do. <laughs> I think we can all recognize what the pattern was that led to the need for that sign. This one's a little harder to read, so I'll read it for you. This is taped to uh, the kitchen wall near a dishwasher. It says, to use dishwasher, first turn on the cold water faucet and run the garbage disposer at the same time until the sink drain is clear. Then shut off the cold water and the garbage disposer, then turn on the dishwasher. If you were to find, if you were to talk to this person and say, does your dishwasher work, yes or no, they would say yes, because it does, just with a lot of adaptations. I think this one speaks for itself. And I'm going to zoom in on this so you can see it in a minute. I took this at a hotel room in Boston um, where I was staying this summer. And I wanted you to, to see that the, um, this is a sign that's put right up against the ceiling near the fire sprinkler. And it says, do not hang items from sprinkler head. This will cause flooding. Now, sure enough, there were very few places in this hotel room where you could hang things. It was kind of annoying. And if you were cleverly working around that problem, you might put some things from the sprinkler. And um, the hotel recognized that this was kind of a problem. But instead of installing hooks, <laughs> they had these little signs, custom made, presumably hundreds of them, and stuck them into, the, into all of the hotel rooms. And there's still nowhere to hang anything. Uh, I can't even imagine what led to the need for the second sign, much less the third sign. <laughs> so a lot of times, I mean, these are really funny, and we see these all the time, right? There are actually some really elegant um, signals that we follow every day that we don't even see. They become second nature to us. They're really invisible signals that prompt our behavior, but we don't even think about it. So here's one. We don't think about this. We don't think, oh, I am now being prompted to cross the street. We just cross the street when we see the signal. This is taken at airport security in Denver, which has a pretty significant airport security situation happening up at front, in the front. And I mean, can you imagine the behavior that would ensue if we were expected to, uh, if, if we weren't expected to line up at airport security? We would scramble all over each other. So these little lane ropes that they've created to kind of keep us orderly and get us to go where they need us to go um, are really very clever things. The, the, the objects themselves are very well designed. They sort of retract and can be reconfigured. But it's not about the thing. It's about what the thing makes us do. And here's one that you almost never notice, but painted lines on, on concrete are the difference between order and chaos in a parking lot. So I think you'll agree from these examples that humans are very good at making things work when we have to. You know, it's raining and you need to protect your camera. You find a plastic bag. But what about when we just want to, when the disruption that we're looking for is actually something that would just be kind of nice? Like, it would be great if you finished your degree. It would be great if you lost a few pounds. I've noticed that with these kinds of things, there are a lot of things that work for different people, but often we also need a thing in these situations. We need something to actually change our behavior. So for example, with dieting, we hear of people who put a lock on their refrigerator or who sleep in their gym clothes so they can get to the gym a little easier the next morning. My friend Steven has found that if he keeps apples on his desk, he won't go in search of the chocolate because, as he puts it, Sloth is more powerful than gluttony. <laughs> so these objectifications of the change really are an excuse to behave differently. We take the idea of the change out of our heads and put it into the world, into our space, right in our faces, and they make us work around them. They make us, they force the behavior change that we're looking for. So this is not, these are not just things that we do for ourselves. There's a market for this stuff. This is an alarm clock that rolls off your bedside table and forces you to chase it around the room to turn it off. <laughs> so 
the idea of using an object to help make a change actually overlaps with a concept in psychology called the transitional object. And this is a concept that was introduced to me by a mentor of mine, Peter Coughlin, many years ago. But it wasn't until recently that I totally nerded out on it. The transitional object is most commonly used in child psychology to talk about a blankie or a teddy bear that a child uses to navigate a really important psychological shift away from attachment to the mother and into sort of an individual being. And this object, which is separate from the mother and separate from the child, is what makes that shift possible. It is just like airport security. If we were just, if it was just simply suggested to us that we politely queue at airport security and respect our fellow travelers and their flight times, we would not be able to handle that. Psychologically, we could not handle that. We would be scrambling for the gate. And so those little lane lines are that are a transitional object in this case. And this gets me really excited because that means that the transitional object is not just something that happens, like a teddy bear that a kid happens to get attached to. It is a designed artifact. It is something that we can put in place on purpose. We can do this deliberately to change behavior. And then I get really, really, really excited when I think about how we could do that at scale. We have established that making things work is something that we do as a natural human tendency. But what if we all banded together and, and sort of put this tendency against some of the problems that we share as a group? And if you look, we actually have done this in a few great places. So these speed, these speed signs that give you feedback on your speed are the number one most effective way to curb speeding uh, on surface streets. And I find this fascinating because this is information that is already available to the driver in the dashboard. <laughs> Um, to take a, a slightly larger problem than um, speeding, uh, this is a, a pocket-sized HIV test that you can take at home. This was designed by some of my colleagues uh, at Frog, and it's part of a much larger initiative. This is designed for distribution in South Africa and some of the most hardest-hit communities by HIV. Um, what we found in our research is that there are a lot of really legitimate and, and emotional reasons uh, that people won't get tested in a clinic. So there are a lot of people who don't know their HIV status, and that's contributing to a much bigger problem. These are designed to fit in your pocket, um, and they're very discreet, and you can do it at home where it's anonymous. Uh, the thing itself is really beautifully designed, actually. The way it unfolds, the lid becomes the holder for the saliva test while the test is running. Um, but it's not about the thing. It's about what the thing makes us do. And in this case, the thing gives access to a vital piece of information that could ultimately change the course of an epidemic. I'm going to offer one final example. This is a story um, about something that takes place inside a movie theater like this. And this is from a book, one of my favorite books on design, called By Design by a man named Ralph Kaplan. It takes place inside a theater like this in the late 1940s in the Midwest, and at that time, the, the movie theater had a segregation policy. Like many movie theaters at that time, the black patrons were required to sit in the last four rows of the theater. And this policy had been in place for as long as anybody could remember, but um, it, was, it was definitely not approved of by the entire community, and a lot of people had tried to fight it, in particular, um, community members at the local university. So they had written letters. Uh, they had come in person to meet with the manager. As far as the manager was concerned, this wasn't really an ethical issue at all. It was, uh, an emo uh, it was a commercial issue. He felt that there were a lot of white patrons who would stop buying tickets if this policy weren't in place. So one evening, a large group of students bought out a single show. And when the doors opened, they flooded in, and white students filled the last four rows completely. The rest of the theater was filled by black and white students together, creating total racial integration. The manager figured out what was going on, and he came in and he tried to fix it. He demanded that the black students move. But move where, they said. The last four rows are completely packed. The white students in the last four rows refused to change seats. He kind of threw up his hands and said, well, just this once, at least I sold out the show. The next morning, letters and telegrams flooded in commending him for his courageous reversal of this policy. <laughs> Public figures declared him a civic leader 
And the newspapers uh, ran stories about this historic decision to integrate the theater. After something like that, you're not going to go back to your segregation policy. And I love this, because this is disruption by design. And that's exactly what this was. This was design. The students planned this in advance. The press releases were prepared well before the event actually happened. And you know, it's, it's just such a brilliant example of what you can do. Now, there's not a thing in this story. There's no thing. There's an action. And in my mind, that counts, because it's not about what, it's not about the action, it's about what the action made happen in this place. So this is design, and we are designers, and I mean we, I mean you. We can do this, we already are doing it, we're putting apples on our desks, we're painting lines in our parking lots, we're doing this already, let's do it big. Gandhi is credited as having said, be the change you wish to see in the world. There was a great column in the New York Times this summer by a guy named Brian Morton, which reveals that there is absolutely no evidence that Gandhi ever said this. <laughs> which is too bad, because it's so pithy and it looks so good on a greeting card. Um, what he did say is this. Oh. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change which is pretty close. <laughs> so, since we are evidently in the pattern of changing Gandhi's words, I would like to offer this further tweak. Design the change you wish to see in the world. Or maybe even better, design the disruption you wish to see in the world. Thank you.